All right, hey Morgan. Howdy. So it's gonna be the it's gonna be the two man weekly space hangout again because dynamic uh, duo. the dynamic duo, yeah. Uh, but because uh, everyone everyone is busy, people are traveling, people are writing books. So uh, you know, neither of us have books to write. So we thought we would. Uh, I wish I was writing a book. Yeah, really. You can you can write a book anytime you want, man. <laughs> I guess. I wish I had the. The nerve to write a book. Oh, see, there's the problem. I give you permission, Morgan. Write a book. <sighs> How's that coming? Um, well, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Fraser <laughs> Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. And this is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, April 11th, 2014. Once again, I am uh, on on the road, on a remote location. But uh, I will be uh, heading back Monday, I think. So back in my normal studio. Studio, um, but uh, so this week uh, we're going to do our best to try and cover some of the big stories. Probably won't be a regular length episode, um, although people do like the kind of back and forth. So we'll see where we get. Uh, we're going to give a we're going to give our review an update on the cosmos latest cosmos episode, um, possible discovery of an exo moon, uh, just an update on that parachute that rock that went past a parachuter, whether it was a meteorite or a rock, we're not sure. Uh, just a big reminder about the lunar eclipse. Uh, the NRO launch, uh, the SpaceX launch, and uh, the radar problems they've been having, and that bright light on Mars. So as always, you can interact with us. Uh, the way to do that is to use the Q&A app, which is, um, should be embedded in the YouTube video that you're watching right now. It says, Fraser is answering questions. Uh, click there, and if you do that, you can get uh, access to where we're uh, to where you can post a question and you can watch the video and post your questions and talk to each other and uh, away we go. All right. Well, let's let's start. You know what? I want to start with Cosmos because I know uh, we both uh, we both watched Cosmos, uh, the latest latest. Oh, we've been watching them all and we yeah. watched the latest one. And this one, episode five, was about I guess the discovery of spectroscopy. I mean, pretty detailed stuff. Yeah. I mean, it was really about how our world and how we interact with our world is shaped by light and it took us hundreds of years to understand uh, you know the nature of the light that allows us to see and allows us to make uh, observations about things like this mouse sitting on my desk to the stars that are as far away as we can see uh, but now that we've made those discoveries they've become by far our most powerful tool in understanding the universe because there's really no other tool available we can understand what we can see. And we can see in the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we understand. And as that grew, our ability to gain in knowledge grew. And it's only been in the last 50 or so years that we've been able to make full use of that. And you can see the remarkable discoveries we've made. How did you, uh, how did you like this episode compared to some of the others? I really liked it. Uh, I think my favorite is probably still the evolution episode. Uh, but this would probably be my second favorite. Uh, I thought they did a much better job this week with using the CGI, the computer graphics, in a very educational way. Uh, I got a huge kick out of seeing the sound waves bounce around the uh, the organ uh, chamber, uh, and even larger kick seeing uh, Neil talking at me with waves coming out of his mouth. Uh, it was a little disorienting. Uh, and I also really liked at the end when we saw the Manhattan skyline uh, in all these different wavelengths, because it gives you a sense that really what we see and what we think of as you know reality is just a narrow band uh, in a much larger uh, sort of window to to the universe. And if we could see in some of these other uh, windows, we'd see a very different picture of the night sky, the day sky, and the universe. Is what well, I thought was great too was that this is Neil deGrasse Tyson's specialty, right? He's an astrophysicist. He studied this while Carl Sagan was a planetary scientist and so this is the stuff that Neil knows best not the exploration of the planets and, and things like that you know although he can, he can obviously speak on that uh, but but so it was great to have sort of some of this material that I'm sure he really carefully picked through the script and was able to make sure that it was that he felt comfortable about the way he could do it and so then he could he was very comfortable and great in doing the presentation so I thought it was a it was great and it was I mean just like prime time they're discussing uh, you know spectral lines and spectroscopy and all this kind of stuff on you know Fox television that's just yeah. we're living in a golden age I I also really like continue to like the stories that they're choosing to tell 
uh, I thought it was a really powerful story uh, to point out at the beginning that for almost a thousand years the Arabic world, the Islamic world, was the center of science here on planet Earth. And that's something that's easy to forget these days when we often think of you know, Arabic countries as being maybe backwards or at least reticent towards science. Uh, we think of the Western world as Western medicine and you know, Western science as pushing the boundaries. But for almost as long as uh, that's been the case, even longer perhaps, it was the case that it was Eastern, the Eastern world that was pushing the boundaries of science. Uh, and so we should be you know, cognizant of the fact that what seems like you know, sort of this dynasty right now uh, could very easily change depending on the decisions that we make and our politicians make in the future. Yeah, so I hope the, the rest will sort of follow on this, this vein. It felt a little less... Um, Preachy. Yeah, preachy. I mean, I feel so bad because I am the preachiest of the preachy, oh, you know? Yeah, like, I, I, well. I I will attack pseudoscience and creationists and nonsense like crazy. So I, you know, I definitely can't... I'm a total hypocrite when I say that it feels like the episodes are a little too too preachy. Like, you know, in the way... There's, there's a lot of kind of jabs at at evolution deniers and, and things like that. Because it's just, I don't know, it just feels like it cheapens the thing. So this one was just very much like, here's a wonderful thing about science. It's one of the most amazing things that we've discovered so far. It really is this, as you said, it's like the bedrock tool that scientists use to probe the cosmos. And here's how it works. And so I really enjoyed it. All right, let's move on. So... Um, Let's talk about this. Uh, let's just talk about this bright light that was seen on on Mars. Yeah. Uh, so right, I the story. Now I know you haven't. Neither of us have actually blogged about it, but now I got a picture here. I think the picture from Curiosity. Is that? Can you see that? Oh, let me see. Uh, yeah. Let me All right. So this is a picture taken by Curiosity uh, on the surface a few days ago. Can you and zoom in on the actual? Yeah, if we zoom in then the on the corner here, this is as close as I can get. You can see this red box. And maybe in this red box you can see there's a little white light. Uh, it kind of looks like someone maybe is shining a flashlight at Curiosity. Or like the glinting eye of a Martian? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, like anything else sun. that doesn't look exactly like we expect, people immediately um, started attributing this to aliens uh, and saying, well, you know, here we have once again, you know, NASA's already ignored that disappearing rock on Mars a few months ago. Here's one more instance of them refusing to acknowledge this obvious presence of alien life on the surface of another world. Uh, and, you know, how can NASA, you know, be so irresponsible? Uh, of course, it turns out that, you know, there's a much simpler explanation, uh, which is that Curiosity contains not one but two cameras on its camera stock because it wants to take 3D pictures. You know, when you take a 3D picture for The Hobbit, put two cameras next to each other, and they mimic your two eyes. Well, Curiosity does the same thing. So this is the right image. And if you look at the left image, you don't see this glint. Um, and that means that it isn't really real, is the bottom line. But it's probably something that required a very careful alignment uh, with just one of the cameras. So this could be like a glint off a rock, for example. A very narrow glint that would hit one camera but wouldn't hit the other camera. If this was a flashlight or an alien's head or something like that, the breadth of the light would be large enough that it would hit both cameras. Right, unless the Martian was just like shooting his low-powered laser right. beam just like, at you know, one laser of Curiosity's planes, eyes. They laser rovers, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other thing it could be, and maybe the most likely thing it could be, is just a tiny blip in the sensor. Yeah. Uh, these things get hit by cosmic rays or just suffer uh, from bad pixel readings once in a while. If you take out your, your camera phone and take a picture of anything, and if you zoom in at a white wall, you'll see some random green pixels and some random red pixels and some random blue pixels. And the same thing's true when you look at images from space. It's just that generally we're a lot better about controlling that than on a you know a cheap camera phone or even a, like an SLR. Yeah, and so I mean, and that's really it, like a cosmic ray. But I guess what what really got people excited is just how well it is aligned with the horizon of of that sort of mountain peak over there. So so you can really see that there's like this this ridge, and then there's that that light. It's like right there 
um, on the ridge, and I guess that's what really got people excited. But I wonder if anyone's like gone back through the older images through the archives and found lots of these kinds of yeah, little if, light. I mean, here. curiosity and spirit and opportunity have returned, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands uh, of images. I mean, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's returned at least that many again. So there's probably a million images of the surface of Mars. You could come through those, and you'd find tons of these. Uh, yeah. And I'm, don't go do this because we don't need any more of these controversies. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you did, you would find these things are everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good. Well, then that's that uh, that mystery solved right there. Um, all right, let's move on. So day. let's do let's deal with another kind of mystery. And this was this uh, we talked about this last week about this parachutist who uh, I guess captured a video of a rock passing or a, a, a meteorite, and it was a suspected meteorite, because how could a rock fly past a parachutist up in the air? And uh, the, I guess the original idea was that, you know, at some point, you know, people had tracked, like you would have a meteorite, it would have entered the atmosphere, would have heated up, exploded, and then would have sort of hit terminal velocity as it came down through the air, and so it would have passed by the, by the, uh, by the skydiver. And and people had done analysis on the on the rate of the fall and where it had come, and it had it was definitely possible that it could have been been a meteorite. But the internet has gone to work and done a lot more research, and it now really appears that it's a uh, it's just a rock that was uh, folded up inside the canopy of the parachute when it was just folded on the on the ground. And apparently, parachutists say this happens all the time that you'll get a rock that's folded up in your parachute, and then as it deploys, the rock kind of tumbles out of the parachute and falls down beside you. Yeah, well, you can imagine it doesn't even have to tumble. You deploy that parachute, it's going to snap out, snap taut, and that could really eject a rock that was in a fold of that parachute, you know, at quite some velocity. Uh, and from, you know, from first to last, this has been carried out really well. Uh, the parachutist didn't go out and claim that he'd seen a meteorite. He took it to some scientists, who then took two years to look at the video, to look for the rock, Eventually, putting it out there, saying we don't really know. We think this could be a meteorite, but you know we're looking for more input. Uh, and lots of people gave their input, and we saw some compelling arguments uh, that it it could go either way. Uh, and I think sort of the final argument I saw came from a NASA scientist who said it's either like a two centimeter rock that passed relatively close to the, the skydiver, or it's like a twenty centimeter meteorite that passed somewhat farther away. But meteorites hit the Earth far less frequently than um, skydivers pack rocks into their parachutes, and therefore right. it's more, much more likely to have been a packed rock than a parachute, although he, he couldn't really rule it out one way or the other. Yeah, and I think the uh, I think you're exactly right. This is this is precisely how science has to work. Is that somebody says, "I just saw a thing. I don't know what it is. Can somebody please find out?" And then the crowd goes to work. They they come up with theories. They test them out, and they come up with what they think is the consensus of the evidence. Same method, whether we're talking about rocks flying past skydivers. Um, Glints of Martian eyes, or uh, you know, what it really reminds change. me of. Yeah, what it really change. reminds me of is the faster than light neutrinos at the LHC. Uh, there's another example where you know they came out and said, you know, we don't think this is true, but this is what we're seeing. And some people took that and ran with it because, oh my God, you know, general relativity is completely broken. Uh, and everybody else took their time and studied the data and came up with alternative explanations. And eventually, we came to a consensus about why these neutrinos weren't flying faster than the speed of light. Uh, and so it's difficult these, these days because science needs to be public and it needs to be collaborative, uh, but bloggers also need to get ad hits. And what? so people... No, 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 that has nothing to do with this. People will take, you know, what's good, sound scientific action and uh, spin it into a story that maybe is a little exaggerated, and you know, certainly you and I would never try to do that. But there are plenty of people out there who are looking for links uh, and nothing else, uh, and that makes it difficult as a scientist to draw the line. You know, when are you public and when are you not? Uh, and both this and the LHC, these are examples where you know this is not a super contentious issue. But if you're like a climate scientist, 
you know, again, you have these readings that you don't really believe, but you feel other people uh, need to see them, it's a lot more difficult to judge, you know, when to put that out for people to see because, you know, the ire of the world is going to come down on you. Uh, and that's unfortunate because the more things that are public in science, the better science can operate. Well, we uh, we definitely do jump on board whenever these things happen, but we tend to come at it from a skeptical point of view. And so, yeah, yeah, you know, as really the publisher of a news organization, uh, I can sort of verify that, you know, taking the skeptical point of view, you don't need to, to breathlessly repeat what everybody yeah, It deserves to be covered. It just deserves to be covered from the right angle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so it's that. still, you can you still get lots of page views on your articles without having to necessarily yeah. hype things up and, and make them sound fake. So, um, all right, well, let's move on. So this is a story that you worked on, which was that there was a possible exomoon discovered. Yeah, so, you know, for the last 15 or 20 years now, we've been discovering exoplanets. Uh, but planets aren't the only thing in our solar system. You know, we have asteroids and comets, and we also have moons. And there's probably about 200 moons around the major objects in our solar system. We've discovered about 150, 160, depending on you know, what you count as a moon and what you count as a major solar system object. But there's more out there. There's probably some around Uranus. There's some around Neptune. Uh, so we expect them to be around the planets, the thousands of planets we've now discovered uh, out there around the other stars. But the trick is that finding a planet is difficult enough. Finding a you know, much smaller moon is an even more challenging problem. Uh, and up till this week, we hadn't had any instances where we thought this had happened. People have been combing through Kepler data looking for the signatures of moons with no luck. Uh, and so what we do, what, what happened, I guess, in, in this instance is we kind of went back to an old school technique for discovering exoplanets. And that's called gravitational microlensing. Uh, and this is old school because it's not repeatable, it's very lucky, uh, you can't really plan for these to happen. So what happens, what does happen is astronomers for some reason are looking at a patch of sky and they'll see a star temporary bl temporarily brighten and then, temporary, and then dim again. And what's happening is there's a star or a planet or something that's passing just right in front of that background star so that its gravity bends more of that light towards us. It acts as a gravitational lens or a magnifier. It makes that star look brighter. But that only happens when the star, this middle object, and us are in a perfect alignment. And these things tend to last for seconds or at most minutes. And once they happen, you can never look at them again because you don't normally yeah. see this intermediate object. Yeah, that's a real tragedy of these observations, that when you get the gravitational microlensing, it's this one-time alignment between these these objects, and then they're never going to line up again. And you're, you're never going to get a situation where the, where the foreground object is going to ever line up with another object no, in your sky. Like, that's it. You had your one chance. Yeah. That's it. The, the good news is is that this the, you know, the upside to this is that microlensing is the most sensitive technique uh, available. And so if you have one object orbiting another, whether that's a star or, or planet orbiting a star or a moon orbiting a, a planet, you'll see that signature as two brightenings, a big brightening from the big object and then a tiny additional brightening from the little object. And by comparing the sizes of those brightenings, you can get an estimate for the relative size of these objects. But if you don't know how far away they are, that's kind of all you know. So they found this object, or this pair of objects, and they said that you know one is like, I think it was 1,800 times larger than the other by mass. And so that could either be like a planet the size of, or a star the size of the sun with a planet the size of Neptune. Or that could be a rogue planet the size of Jupiter with a moon about the size of the Earth. Wow. And, or a little smaller. Uh, and the only way to differentiate between those is to know how far away they are. But the only way to get that is to observe the object a second time. And if, especially if it's a rogue planet, which puts off basically no light, uh, there's just no way to ever find, uh, find that object again. So we're left with you know, a what if, basically. Maybe we've just seen our first exomoon, uh, maybe not. Uh, and we'll probably see some more of these events as telescopes become more sensitive. But again, we'll probably be unsure if we're seeing a planet and a moon or a star and a planet. 
Yeah, gravitational microlensing is one field that actually the amateurs can get involved in. So if you've got a pretty good rig, there's whole uh, groups of, of amateurs who are involved in these networks of, of, and they'll get alerts when there's a potential microlensing event coming up and people can get involved in the observations. And sometimes amateurs are the ones that contribute or even discover these extrasolar planets, and I guess, you know, in this case, the chances are that you can actually discover a, a, an exomoon, which would be mind-bending. Right, yeah, I mean, there's just so much sky out there, uh, and so few astronomers and, you know, astronomical-grade telescopes, professional-grade telescopes, that, you know, at any given time, we're looking at, you know, the, the slimmest, slimmest fraction of the sky, uh, but, uh, you know, the tens or hundreds of thousands of people out there every night with their telescopes are seeing a lot more of the sky. And since these events are essentially random, you have, you know, just as good, if not better, chance than a professional to, to detect one of these things happening. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, well, that's really cool. Um, so now, I just want to give a reminder, which is that there's going to be a lunar eclipse in just a couple of days now. So... Uh, this is going to be a total lunar eclipse. We mentioned this last week, and Dave went into the details and all the blood moon and all that kind of stuff. But just to sort of make sure you, you know what's going on. So it's going to be happening at uh, 4.37 in the morning, universal time. Uh, but it's going to be 12.37 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on the 15th. And those, so for those of us on the West Coast, it's going to be on the 14th, the night of the 14th at uh, around 9.30, which is perfect. That is the perfect eclipse. So if you have never seen a total lunar eclipse, this is your chance. If you live in North America, which I know most of, most of our viewers do, uh, you're going to want to head out anywhere between 9 o'clock and, you know, 9 o'clock if you're on the West Coast, midnight if you're on the East Coast, sorry, East Coast, uh, and then stick around for a few hours and watch the watch bites get taken out of the moon, and then it'll turn blood red, and then bites will come back into the moon, and then it will be clear. And it's, it's absolutely one of my favorite uh, events to see. And what's great about this is you don't need... Uh, you don't need any kind of special protective gear. You know, you're just looking at the moon, and the moon turns red, and it's it's great to kind that of gather together. Hours. You know, you don't have to get out there for the exact minute, like with a yeah, solar eclipse. Yeah, house. totally. You, you can just look go out, out sometime at night, and you'll see it. And you'll see it happening. Like, wow! And it looks very different from the crescent moon, from any other shape of the moon. Like, it's clearly a chomp is getting taken out of it. So, uh, if you've never seen a lunar eclipse, this is like we haven't had one of these in years now. Probably three or four years that we've had a nice lunar eclipse visible in you know from North America in the evening. So this is your chance. So remember, um, you're going to want to go out there on the 14th, the night of the 14th, or the morning of the 15th, and uh, and watch it. Have you seen a bunch of lunar eclipses? I think I've only seen like one or two in my life. Uh, yeah, like you said, you know, total lunar eclipses aren't terribly common. Uh, I think this is an unusual year where we're going to have two or three in the same year. Uh, and unfortunately, I've spent most of my life living in places that are cloudy uh, for a lot of time. And so, um, you know, I've missed out on plenty of plenty of possible eclipses in the past. I'm sure, yeah, where I live, west coast of Canada, in this is like the cloudy, rainy time, so I'm sure I won't get a yeah, chance. I'm fingers that. crossed this time that yeah. I get it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, great. Well, let's move on. So I think the last story we're going to cover, uh, and then we'll answer some questions, is sort of the series of launches and the radar problems that have been happening with, uh, with NASA. So do you want to... Tell me what's going on. Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, two launches were supposed to take place out of Cape Canaveral. The first was from the NRO, which is the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, and they basically launched spy satellites. So we actually have no idea what they're launching. We just presume that they're you know, spy satellites for the U.S. and for NATO. Uh, but they're there. They're, I guess, important if you, know, you like you know, national security. Uh, more interesting, to, people. Yeah. Yeah, more, more interesting to the rest of us might have been might be the SpaceX launch, and this is just going to be uh, SpaceX's I think fourth trip delivering uh, equipment supplies to the International Space Station. Uh, but what's cool is you might remember a, a month or so ago I mentioned that uh, they've bolted landing legs 
on the side of the SpaceX rocket. And although they're not going to actually try to land this one, they're going to deploy the legs once they've launched and released the Dragon capsule uh, and try to sort of mimic uh, a landing procedure uh, by hovering, you know, over the ocean. Uh, and they're setting expectations pretty low here. I think they're hoping to get the legs out. I think they're hoping to measure how the legs affect the stability of, this, of the rocket, and they're hoping to restart the engine uh, using that stability. Uh, and then as we go forward to future launches, they're hoping to uh, practice hovering over the ocean surface and eventually then hovering over uh, landing pads and basically reusing these uh, Falcon rockets. Um, the problem uh, was, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Eric Charlin just posted that the uh, there's going to be launch for Monday at 4.58 Eastern Time. Live webcast is going to start at 4.20 Eastern Time. That's PM? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, PM. Yeah, so, so that'll be on NASA, NASA.TV. Yeah. Uh, always good fun to watch uh, those launches. Uh, but they were supposed to happen, I think it was maybe March uh, 30th. That was supposed to be the launch date for the SpaceX capsule. Uh, and that didn't happen. And that, hap that was because uh, the major radar, tracking radar, on the east coast, the southern east coast of the U.S., uh, caught on fire. Uh, there was an electri yeah, electrical short somewhere in the radar, and it basically burned down. Uh, and this radar is critical because this is how we monitor the trajectory of the rockets once they're launched off of Cape Canaveral. Uh, we know we look, we, NASA TV points their cameras at them, and we can sort of see where they're going, but the radar gives the precise information. Uh, and this is important because, although it happens extremely infrequently these days, once in a while a rocket will you know, veer off course. You know, one of its engines gets stuck or shuts down, and it starts veering over the relatively populated uh, you know, Florida coast, you know, coming after Dave, basically. Yeah. Um, and when that, that happens, bad. they have to be able to self-destruct the rocket you know, at a moment's notice. And so having this giant working radar uh, is an absolutely mission-critical um, requirement, and so they had to postpone all launches of any size from basically the southern half of the United States until they could get this radar back online. Uh, and so what they've done is they've made a combination of repairs to the, ex the existing radar, and they've brought sort of a backup secondary radar online uh, as well. And that made them comfortable enough to launch the NRO rocket yesterday, and that lifted off successfully yesterday afternoon, uh, and is presumably now you know, watching our houses right now. Uh, yeah. And that gives them confidence in the SpaceX launch that should happen then on on Monday um, and deliver, you know, hopefully peace pipes to the astronauts on the uh, space station. Right. Very cool. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to take some comments and questions. I think that was all the stories we wanted to cover this week. So I'm going to take some comments and questions here. Um, uh, Dale Jacobs notes that Nancy posted an article about the parachutist that must have packed a rock up when when folding his chute. So yeah, so we just posted that. Or Nancy just posted that article to Universe Today and goes into the details and gets quotes from the original researchers who were trying to figure this out. Um, Rich Hayward says well, maybe the Martian was looking for his jelly donut. So jelly donut, of course, was that that rock that that was uh, there on the surface of Mars, and people were wondering what that was, and uh, clearly that was, you know, the, the glinty-eyed Martian was looking for the, for the jelly donut. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, okay, so Dale Jacobs notes that a classic example, and this is back to sort of science being done right, is Pons and Fleischmann's cold fusion claim. Um, and uh, we did a, an episode on on uh, cold fusion in uh, in astronomy cast and sort of covered that. And you know that was a good example, I think, of of not necessarily the scientists, but other people as well, really trying to push people to go public with what could be a very big piece of information, as opposed to going through the right channels and going and getting it peer reviewed and so on. Uh, Pons and Fleischmann went public, but. It, you know, it sounds like it wasn't necessarily their choice. There's a lot of pressure coming. Yeah, there's through. enormous pressure from all sides. You know, scientists yeah. want to show that they're making progress so that the funding agencies will continue to, you know, support them. And the funding agencies like NASA or the NSF or the National Institutes of Health want to show that progress is made so that uh, Congress and the taxpayers will continue to support them. Uh, and, you know, the media and taxpayers want to see progress because they want to know that you know good things are happening in the world 
And so, you know, there's pressure that comes on you from all sides pretty much at all times to say something cool that's happening, even if you're not 100% sure about it. And, you know, as the magnitude of these discoveries uh, ratchets up, whether it's cold fusion or, you know, a cure for HIV or cancer or malaria or, or what have you, uh, you know, we have to be more and more careful about what we say and when we say it uh, because, you know, you don't get two chances to roll out uh, an announcement and yeah. you want to get it right the first time and you want people to take you seriously the first time and if you know you're the kind of person who's five times announced that you've solved cold fusion if you really have solved it in the sixth time it's going to be a lot harder to get people to uh, you know write stories and you know review your papers yeah I mean you think about all the times we've heard that cancer has been cured you know and yeah. it's just like it has not so yeah, I mean, you, you just you, you're jaded now you don't believe it yeah. uh, and so when eventually you know someone does cure a kind of cancer uh, it's going to take a lot more you know to convince people and they're going to you have to work harder to get the attention for it because so many people have burned us in the past and that's unfortunate uh, okay so hugo burnham says i i think i read that 35% of msl images have cosmic ray strikes on them before cleanup so there you go so tons of cosmic rays now, you know, I, I don't know that statistic, so... You know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's about right uh, for any... And, you know, Mars does have a slight atmosphere that's going to absorb a few of those. You know, you look out in space, and you look at raw images from Hubble or Cassini or something like that, you can see images where there's just cosmic ray strikes everywhere. Yeah. There, you know, there's cosmic rays going through your body right now. Uh, and you know, yeah. as distressing as that is to to think about, uh, yeah, and they're everywhere, the and they're, they're unavoidable, and we put a lot of effort into correcting for them, uh, so that we you know don't have to see them in our final images. But they can look like shooting stars, they can look like comets, they can look like you know moons, they can look like Martians. They're you know it's a puzzling thing, and once you know they're there, you're like, oh yeah, that's probably a cosmic ray. But if you don't know it, you're like, oh my god, there's like this giant camera coming down. Um, into the Earth's atmosphere, or I've discovered an alien on Mars, or you know I found the third largest moon of Jupiter, um, and you just have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, okay, well I think I think those are all the big questions we've got here. Uh, Hugo Burnham wants to know what are the chances of discovering an exomoon orbiting an exoplanet that is orbiting a multiple star system? I mean, the chances that that exists are, you know, like 100 percent. Uh, somewhere out there in the universe that exists. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can look so at let's get that out of the way first. If you can imagine yeah. a planetary configuration, and we haven't found it yet, we'll probably find it soon, because we found some truly absurd and previously unimaginable uh, configurations. I just saw your video on uh, yeah, the Pat 17 Tatooine world. circumbinary um, you know, systems out there yeah. with planets. The trick is that every time you add something like that, you add complexity. And so just two stars orbiting each other with planets gets brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer as the stars pass in front and behind of each other. That's the same way we look for planets using Kepler. You know, you add a planet into that mix, now you have three peaks and dips going on. Uh, you add a moon into that mix, now you have, not only do you have four peaks and dips, but you have four peaks and dips of different sizes, of which the more interesting ones, the planet and the moon, are by far the smallest. Uh, and so, you know, we will find those. It's just a question of whether you know Gaia does it in the next couple of years, or whether it's going to take something like the Terrestrial Planet Finder, or even a further generation of technology to resolve those things. But you, you can be sure that they're out there, and you can be sure that we'll find them. It's just a question of how long that might take. Well, we've been talking about you know people are looking for a real Tatooine, and I guess people are going to be looking for a real Endor, right? Yeah, I mean, hopefully there's not a real Death Star uh, in <laughs> or, orbit. Yeah, if you orbit detect, about it. Right? Yeah, you can detect the Death Star orbiting the end or orbiting the planet, orbiting this. Yeah, See that, that be, green laser coming towards yeah, us. And, uh, that's that's no sound moon. Sound the alarm. That's a space station. Uh, cool. So why don't we wrap this up? So uh, so Morgan, uh, where do people find out more about you? Yeah. So the website is cosmicchatter.org. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter at cosmic underscore chatter. I think you can also follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg, uh, although I'm not particularly active uh, in tweeting on that account. So definitely drop me a line, ask ask a question, just say hi. I love to hear from people. And now, were you planning to stick around after and and hang out in the space? Yep. Community? Yep. So I'll be at this this Google Plus Space Community uh, for the next hour or two at least. Uh, we'll see how questions go. 
Uh, so if you have any other questions, space-related or not, I suppose, uh, I'll be happy to take a crack at answering them. Uh, and if I don't know, I'll try to find someone who does. Fantastic. All right. And once again, I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and uh, you can watch, uh, if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel, this YouTube channel that you're watching this on, and we will, uh, and you'll get lots more good stuff uh, almost every day. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, Morgan, for, yeah, uh, for showing up. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you all next week.